Uh, so the screen's a little bit smaller than I thought it was. So you probably can't read anything on any of the slides, but that's what we did. So we're going to do something a little bit different to usual in that because I'm going to kind of cover quite a lot of stuff, like a like surface level. And um, let's try and see what happens if we if you have questions about stuff, like ask them throughout. Uh, and I might terminate this idea like halfway through, this, <laughs> but. Let, let's try this and see how it goes. Right, so this is me. Uh, it's even the same t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> yes. Where do I get that t-shirt? Uh, the, the internet. I think we no, in fact, we can't get this one. But we do have a new one. We've got a, because it's Pride Month this month, uh, I think. Uh, or in America or something. So yeah, we have a Pride t-shirt and we have a Transocat t-shirt as well. So <laughs> you'll be able to buy them shortly. I'm not messed up with that yet. Yes? Our uh, dog's called Lucy. Uh, she is a senior engineer at yeah. the <laughs> That's how you can contact her. <laughs> she is a cocker spaniel. Let's. Let's. Most of the things are going to going slowly on. I, I may or may not choose to accept your question. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, so, I'm going to give you this lovely overview, which you can't read, of how you build software. What I'm going to talk to you about is, because I figured it's kind of interesting, I think, not just the way we kind of deploy software or write software or whatever. Quite often, like, we end up doing talks about like, one of these individual things. So I figured it'd be interesting to do like, a talk based on, okay, you're an engineer at GitHub, and you get given a laptop, and you haven't done anything to that laptop. Like, let's talk about like, what it looks like to go from you having a new laptop to you pushing go to production. So, first thing, we do is this little project thing that I built called Strap. So before there was Strap, there was a thing called Boxen. Uh, Boxen was like a previous GitHub project that used Puppet to like manage people's development machines, uh, and basically that was a bad idea. Um, I, I'm not going to get into much details, but effectively, my high-level thinking, having used Puppet Chef in situations more or less universally where they're a bad idea is that they work well for what they're designed for, they don't work well when people monkey around with the computer underneath, and then Puppet goes, hey, I'm going to do some stuff, oh, you've changed everything, ah, and then dies. <laughs> and so, I, in, as I alluded to earlier on, uh, I replaced a, like, you know, multi-thousand lines of Puppet and stuff uh, with a hundred line bash script instead. So, this is what Strat does, is you can go to this strat.github.com, or it's like, you can basically, with one click, like spin it up on Heroku. Uh, it's not that one. I'll show you another thing in a second. Basically, what it does is installs like a minimal set of stuff that is probably useful for developers. Now, by minimal set, I mean like really minimal because I hate having like craft on my machine. So pretty much all it does is does stuff like turn on file vault, uh, set up your GitHub like uh, credentials so you can close repositories and stuff like that. Uh, installs Homebrew, but doesn't actually install anything in Homebrew, and stuff like that. Uh, installs Homebrew because I'm a Homebrew maintainer as well, so I'm wise. Uh, <laughs> so basically the way it works is you get your new laptop, you then go to this site, it will then ask you to log in using your GitHub um, details, you log in doing that, and then you have a little script that you download. Uh, note I'm not doing the whole pipe to the bash script into the terminal thing, because I would actually have done that, but it was going to be harder, so I didn't. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I no, someone was waving or something. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, right, so I download the script onto my machine, I then run it with bash like this, it's then asking for my password, and um, so it can go and do stuff like turn on firewall and other things that require root, unfortunately. So it then goes and does a bunch of stuff, and then at the end you might see something that looks a bit like this. Uh, your system is now strapped. It doesn't take very long, it takes like maybe five or ten minutes the first time. Uh, it's like designed to be rerun multiple times, but you shouldn't have to rerun it multiple times. It's basically just like a one-off, fire and forget thing, and then your machine is set up. What's happened here is a cool little integration it has as well with a thing I kind of helped work on called Homebrew Bundle. And what Homebrew Bundle does is it uses like a brew file, which is kind of like a gem file. You guys are familiar with like gem files or similar type of things? Basically, we're specifying all your project dependencies. It's like that, but for stuff in Homebrew and specifying system dependencies. So I basically have that so I can have a bunch of stuff that I say when I set up a new machine, like in my dot files repository, it knows to automatically go and download like this brew file if it's not there already, 
um, and install it from there. So it can install stuff from Homebrew, Homebrew Cask, and now the Mac App Store as well. So it's installed for me like Xcode and Vagrant and all these other things. Right, so this is open source, the strap thing. You can go on like microquery slash strap on GitHub and like access the code and it's got a one click put it on Heroku thing as well. Any question? So uh, from the previous slide. Yeah. I can ask um, how IMUV is useful for development. Uh, it's not really. It's useful for doing not development because I try to do as much not development as I can. <laughs> yeah. How is transmission useful? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> For downloading a Ubuntu ISO. <laughs> <laughs> That's the last time I used that screenshot again. <laughs> so yeah, and then this is like my little group file thing. It's also in my file files repository if you're interested like in critiquing my software choices. <laughs> which obviously people are. Um, so yeah, so it's kind of a good way and you can kind of dump and restore things from that. So it's kind of a nice way of being like, I want to be able to restore everything on my system in a way that's not like kind of keyness or whatever. Oh, what's the GitHub app? GitHub app, uh, that is the GitHub like desktop app, uh, GitHub for Mac, it's like designed to be kind of like a novice UI for using uh, Git, but I find it useful for doing like one thing that I really like UIs for with GitHub, which is like individual like, uh, like staging individual lines to the index. Anyway, moving on, uh, so Homebrew Bundle, this is this other thing you can do. It's part of Homebrew, you run like Brew Bundle and it will set some of the Brew files, it's very exciting. Right, so, you've now got Strap on your machine. This is very good. So, now you want to get GitHub on your machine so you can actually do some work. So, uh, we go make our, ourselves a little GitHub directory, that's just a little convention we do internally, and then we CD do it, and then we clone it. Uh, and then obviously that is going to go download, like, GitHub, GitHub, that's like where the bulk of the site is. GitHub is mainly like, not entirely, but like mainly a kind of one of the Rails app. See, you can make Rails skill. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so this is a kind of download to the machine, and then when that's all done at the end, then the next thing we have is, we've got a nice little principle on GitHub projects uh, that we try and keep the setup um, for any given project, and similarly like what CI looks like, what testing looks like, whatever, effectively consistent between every project. So what we have is we have the script subdirectory, um, and in the script subdirectory, you have, in pretty much every project, a thing called bootstrap. So what that does is basically says, okay, I have a machine which assumes nothing except you have strap installed. So at this point, I do not have my SQL installed, I do not have any Rubies installed, I do not have Git installed, I do not have any of these type of things. So this is at this point, sorry, I do have Git installed, that's a lie. <laughs> but it's, it comes with a risk accident. But you basically don't have what you would consider system dependencies already installed, and this bootstrap strip will then go through the brew file and actually install that stuff for you. Uh, I think that's kind of cool because I always find when I go and use a new project, like I hate having some wiki page or whatever that's like, you need to manually install these hundred things, then run these hundred scripts, then you need to ask Bob what to do next. But Bob left the company two years ago, and yeah, you probably just can't do any work for a week. So, uh, yeah, so. This bootstrap, it may compile things, like basically it's a really like high level abstraction, so it can do more or less whatever it needs to do. So sometimes it will pull binaries off the internet, sometimes it will compile things, sometimes it will do other things. Like it basically, its job is at the end, you should be able to run another script, which I'm not actually gonna show you today, but like you should be able to run, if it's like a web app, like script server afterwards, and script server will just work and will like spin up a, Web server on machine so you can like run the application. Right, so while it's going through, it's doing stuff like this. It's installed some gems, it's put some files in some places, it's downloaded GitHub's own internal forker kit because we do things with Git. Uh, and then, as I said, it's compiled it and built these things. It's going away, doing NPM and all this type of thing. And then at the end, eventually it's done. Uh, it's also nicely set up our kind of local database and stuff like that for us as well. And then we're all good to go, we're done, we have our like, special GitHub Ruby, and the bootstrap is finished. So, now we can actually start doing some work. So, if you're interested in the way this stuff is done, we have like a, a repository for this called Scripts to Rule Them All at GitHub, which is sort of an example, like template scripts. These actual template scripts look almost identical to what they look like in some of our kind of more simple projects. The GitHub GitHub uh, template script 
has to do like loads of stuff because it's setting up a few, like I said, it's like mostly a monolithic Rails app. It also sets up a few of the other projects that it needs. But like for some of our smaller projects, some of the kind of microservices we run, like these bootstrap scripts are like 10 lines of bash. And so they can be really, really nice and simple. Um, and you can go to see like bootstrap script in there. You can see it's kind of referring to blue files here if you're on Darwin, which is the kernel name of our site. Uh, so then after that, it's time for me to write code. And because I am relatively old, I still use TextMate. I think I'm the only person still using TextMate. All the cool kids now use Sublime and Atom and things like that. And um, please don't tell me my coworkers I'm pointing at it because I'll get shot. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I pull off my editor and then I don't show you any code because I decided to be boring. Um, and then I do some stuff. And then after I've done some stuff, I run git diff and it says, in fact, I have done stuff. Um, I have changed four lines in this model. So the fun thing with this thing today is partly due to my lack of preparation and partly due to like trying to make this a real example. Like this is actually from now on, this is actually code that I ran and deployed to production today. Um, and the stuff you're seeing actually happened. Uh, it's, it should have some disclaimer or something like that. Anyway, so next thing, obviously, we're dealing with Git. So we go and create ourselves a nice little branch. Git's telling us, hey, this file's still not modified. It's still not committed, so you might want to do something about that. So I do do something about that. I commit it, write a nice commit message. Um, basically, this is what I was doing this morning. The boring little story is we have we we're using things called serialized attributes. This is what I was doing today, which is like a way of putting a JSON blob in a database column, so like you don't have to do migrations. Turns out that's a bad idea in the long term. <laughs> um, so we've been killing these, and one of the things you have to do when you're removing columns, sometimes in Rails, is we have this little thing called attribute ignore, which stops Rails from exploding when you want to remove columns underneath it that it thinks should exist and stuff like that. So this is what this does, um, and this is what I'm writing about here. So I run my commit message, I then commit, and I have a commit on my machine. Very exciting, and my branch and stuff. Um, so now I'm gonna go push this onto GitHub, create a new branch, <coughs> go onto GitHub itself, and then if you use GitHub or not, I don't know, you get this nice little like, thing at the bottom that says, hey, you might want to create a pull request there from this new branch you've got there, buddy. Um, so I'm going to now open a pull request, and this is going to get interesting again soon. I realize this is a point in the middle where we're doing, because everyone's used to GitHub at this point, where it's like, yes, we all know this, we all do this a hundred times every day, why are you showing this to the bottom bit? But it's going to get good, don't worry. Right, so. Uh, this is another little convention we tend to do. Like we make use of kind of teams and stuff on GitHub and individuals. So I'm basically going and seizing a few of my coworkers to ask them for some review. We generally try and unless something's like everything is on fire and it's falling down, we try to get at least one person to review every single change we make to like any project at the company because humans are terrible and it's a good idea to verify that they're being you know terrible with two people on the one. Uh, so we also like to use gratuitous use of emoji instead of words because pictures are better or something. Um, so in this case, I've like cc the person who was working on this thing before I was and my team that I work on so they can kind of check that I'm actually still occasionally thinking. Right, so we then have, after we push up this branch, we have like a lot of CI jobs that run. As you can see, this project has relatively few in that we only have 15 separate CI jobs. There's some that have like 30. Um, we actually have, fun fact, I don't know if this is still the case today, but last time I checked, GitHub had more CI machines than any other type of machines in the company. Because <laughs> like waiting for builds is really boring. So you want to be able to go and push stuff up and have all your builds run in a very short period of time. And when you have huge test suites, it's also nice to not be able to have to not have to do that on your local machine. You can still run tests on your local machine, but it takes forever, and let's just throw a lot of hardware at it instead. So, we have all these different things. We have this GitHub Enterprise product that I used to work on, so it's like checking that we've not broken that, and GitHub, and then GitHub with like various flags enabled and disabled and whatever. I'm running through a test suite in various different ways. So, then after that, this is when it starts to get a little more interesting. So, now I've decided that my code is like, yeah, it's good enough that I can go and like start planning at least to put in production. So we have this is in Slack. We have this like Slack bot that was previously a campfire bot called Hubot. 
And you ask Qbot to do things, and he does things for you, and that's cool. So here, what I'm doing, on a lot of projects, what I could do is just say, like, deploy should production. But because I'm working on the main GitHub app, like, it turns out that's actually, like, pretty busy and pretty congested. Like, even, thankfully, I'm in UK hours, so, like, it's not that congested for me. But when I went to deploy this morning, there were, like, three other people already either waiting to or currently kind of deploying. So, basically, you do this to be polite and kind of get in the queue. So, it says there's one other person ahead of me right now. So, if you forget how, there's currently one guy out there who's testing production. I, his code is what's on the website right now. And then there's Miguel and me who are currently kind of waiting to deploy our code. So, Miguel shows up in my PR, because he's on my team, and says, like, looks good to me. But the PR only contains deleted code. I also agree with that sentiment. Um, so at this stage as well, all the CI jobs have passed, but it's whining at the bottom about it's out of date, out of date with the base branch. Um, so basically, what we'll talk about that more a little bit in a second. But that's like a thing you can enable now to basically just say like, hey, you might want to merge master into your branch. But I'm not going to do that right this second because like master is changing all the time. If there's two people ahead of me. I'll talk about more about this in a second, but with the deploy, the way we do deploys, so there's two people ahead of me, that's master gonna change probably once or twice more before I come to do my deploy. So that's push on with this. Right. So because he said that that's good to go, some nice timing here is that it's now time for me to deploy. Um, I'll just note as well on the previous one, I had merged master in once before just to make sure that things aren't too weird. Uh, and I made another change in that, like PR before Miguel came along and said that. So Qbot is now, I got to the front of the deployment queue, so it's now time for me to deploy to production. So what I do now is, this is how you deploy I get on. Um, this is one of the things I think is the best of the company, and it's one of the things that kind of terrifies people, in that you don't need to speak to anyone, you don't need to ask anyone permission, whatever, like in your first week, you will be encouraged to do this and deploy actual code to production. Every engineer in the company, regardless of whether they work on this app or that or whatever, they can deploy code to any app at any time, more or less. And there's times, obviously, we're getting like attacked or whatever, that people say, okay, let's lock this down to kind of gently discourage people from doing this right now. But even then, that's kind of more a social contract than like an actual one. So our way of doing deployment is generally like we put a lot of trust on people. So anyone can deploy, but if you did deploy, and you break everything, we're probably going to notice, and we're going to notice that like it was you, and we're going to probably ask questions as to like what happened and why that happened or whatever. So, in this case, I'm saying deploy GitHub, which is the app I'm working on right now, my branch name, which is the one I pushed up, and I used to create PR. Again, our deployments always tend to be around like deploying pull requests. We don't kind of put everything to master and then deploy them. We deploy our, our branches to production. So, and I'm saying to production slash canary. This is saying a subset of our production hosts, the canary in the coal mine. So if things start exploding, then that's a few hosts that are exploding and not all of the hosts. So then Qbot has nicely merged master into my branch here, and then like push that to the branch, and then when the CI finishes, Qbot will then deploy. Now the reason why Qbot merged master in is because you want to make sure that whatever the last person did on their branch, Particularly, like they could have done something which was pushing some really, really important fix. They commit that to master. I haven't been paying attention. I haven't noticed that they've done that. If I deployed there, if master wasn't merged into my branch, then I would just undo their fix when I deployed my branch to production. And that would be bad. So, at this point, I then go and it says we're deploying to all these machines, um, which is the subset that Canary is dealing with. And then it has some nice little gentle things at the bottom saying like check out this stuff to make sure it can broken anything. The other nice thing with you know a convention example, which I'm not going to show you today, if you skip the canary deployment, uh, Hubot is just really passive aggressive. So instead of blocking you, it just says uh, Hubot says, skipping the canary deployment, eh? A bold strategy. <laughs> but let's do it anyway. So, um, so yeah, so then that's deployed, it takes like in this case, like, it took 34 seconds to deploy that to the subset of machines. And then it's now on me to make sure that like deployment has not broken stuff. So 
I mentioned this deployment dot confidence dashboard on Haystack. Haystack is like our internal new relic key thing. Uh, we're not going to show you that because it's boring, uh, but I will show you the deployment dashboard because it's exciting. Uh, guess which of the two I built. Um, <laughs> so this is this dashboard here. Uh, this, there's a bunch of graphs that, unfortunately, if I tried to put them all on the screen, would be incomprehensible. So if you instead have one graph that's incomprehensible instead. Um, over here, these blue lines correspond to like when people have deployed stuff. So that last one at the end, that's me having deployed something there. And then these different like colors of lines at the bottom refer to like different types of exceptions, basically. Get up, being get up, we're being constantly attacked, we're being constantly like having people like abusing our API and all those sorts of things. So we do have like weird exception spikes and things like that. But what I'm looking for here when I go to the deployment conference dashboard is basically the my the number of exceptions hasn't gone like that when I deploy. If it's, as you have here, like we've got slow queries, like if they are kind of a bit spiky and stuff like that before, then that's okay. I know that if that happens during my deployment, I'm okay because this isn't something weird that's happened due to me. This is just kind of back So, yeah. I can't quite see man. What's the, the time axis like? So we have time in here. You can actually adjust it at the top of the page and look at that cropped off, but this has gone from 1.48 in the morning, San Francisco time, until 2.16 at the end. But we, at the top of the page, as I say, that I've cropped off, you can adjust that to be, by the time access to be anywhere from like 15 minutes to 30 days, to kind of like look at patterns, obviously, when you're kind of interested in how much is like me and my background noise versus the kind of general noise. And obviously, like, the way our traffic behaves, like, varies from day to day during the week and stuff as well, so it's sometimes useful to like look at seven day access and whatever. And then here on the left hand side, we have the, like, the number of exceptions that are going on permit. So, uh, after my deploy has been in Canary for long enough, and I've not been paged, and none of my coworkers have been paged by me being bad, <coughs> then he goes and says, okay, you've been in production long enough for the Canary, at least probably all right to deploy production properly. <coughs> so, I now then, well, this command below. And then that's going to go and deploy that to every production machine that we have. Yep. How's the bot determining an adequate time in production to for your canary? So it's doing it based on uh, basically just the amount of time since since the deployment finished. It's basically after that got some timer in the background, which is going and then looking. Um, and if there's not, I think it's also triggered such that if no one has been paged due to like an incident happening, then that's like decided that that is an okay metric, you've not broken anything badly enough for people to be working at the end of the night, therefore you're probably safe to go through. But at this point anyway, you, you generally always still be like checking stuff and making sure that you definitely have broken stuff. So after that, uh, it's going to go and deploy through, it then takes 148 seconds to deploy to all our production machines, and then I get this again, just a little reminder to go and check that I haven't broken things, because yeah, we do this sometimes. Um, the fun fact, in very early GitHub days, some of you may remember this, uh, this stuff used to also include checking Twitter to make sure, it, see if anyone is currently <laughs> complaining about GitHub being broken. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, so then I'm going to go back to the deployment conference dashboard. I now have my little blue line from 2.14 back there, and my other little blue line from my new deployment back there. It started to kind of creak up a little bit, so that's a little bit concerning, but I'm not going to be too concerned about that. And then in the PR itself, and again, you can all do this through the API. This is all like fully supported stuff. It nicely tells me, okay, I've done these deployments here, deployed to Canary, and then I deployed to production. So now in the pull request itself, it's now showing people what they come along with this pull request, like that I have been a good boy, I went to Canary first, and I've not just merged this to master without testing it. So that would also be bad. So then after this, I'm relatively confident this code is working, it's fine. I then merge this pull request in. So then what that's going to do after that is then it says the next person in the deployment queue can then go off and deploy stuff themselves. Uh, it's worth maybe mentioning a little bit because I've heard a lot of different ways that people do deployment. And I've kind of worked a few companies to do deployment in different ways. And I'm of the humble opinion that this is the best and possibly the only decent way of deploying to web app service at scale. And the reason why is because the thing that all, the thing that quite a lot of companies do is kind of this idea of 
maybe employ whatever, four times a day, ten times a day, whatever, or in big organizations, four times a month, four times a decade, whatever. <laughs> um, the problem with that is if you have a bunch of people working on stuff and one of them breaks something in that time period, how do you determine who broke what and when? Uh, if, you, if you're dealing with pull requests and branches and stuff like that, if you're not going to be deploying each pull request to production like this, then if you're deploying instead four pull requests, ten pull requests, a hundred pull requests, when one of them breaks something, how do you know which one? How do you know who broke it? How do you know what they were doing and whether that breakage is maybe, like, whether there's stuff in that production deploy that's more important than the breakage or whatever? And I, I think the nice thing I really like about this model, at least, is it's a way of basically, A, putting the responsibility in the hands of the developer is that we have an infrastructure team and they kind of keep an eye on us and make sure our systems are running properly. But whether I break something in my production is down to the individual developer. And all of our engineers and most of our designers and kind of product people even as well, if they're making changes to the site, they will be the ones who deploy it to production. They will be the ones who monitor it. They will be the ones who choose whether or not to back it out, whether the stuff's broken, or whether to kind of merge the request and kind of move things forward if things are working. And for me, at least, like that's a nice way of balancing the kind of responsibility aspect with the being able to identify what problems are early on aspect. So, after all this has happened, I then sporadically am going to go and check the performance confidence dashboard again, because I still, even though it's merged and stuff like that, it's someone else's stuff, I still want to make sure that I haven't broken anything, because breaking things is bad. Um, and that's basically it. So, you've seen through this flow of like what I did, for example, today to actually like push a change to production. And this is something that probably almost every engineer in GitHub is doing like probably zero to three times a day. And um, so I can't remember the, I should have got the number off the top of my head, but the number of deploys we have in a given day is probably like, we're probably deploying every 10, 20 minutes, pretty much 24 hours of the day, like all the way through, because uh, we have people in the time zones all around the world. I, the cool thing is, is that all this stuff can be done in such a way that we have a smart infrastructure team that means this stuff can be done in such a way that it doesn't disrupt our site. And that we can continue to work and iterate in very small chunks constantly rather than having like big, big ships where, as I mentioned before, all the kind of risks that come with that approach. So we've run through these things. So first, we reached out to our Mac. Uh, that's the default machine you have at GitHub. Uh, we cloned GitHub. We reached out GitHub. We wrote some code. We committed it. We created a pull request. We then deployed that to production. We then make sure that we didn't break stuff, and then we merged it. Mm -hmm. So, there's some of the open source projects I mentioned there, and if there's any other questions, please. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I wondered, um, so what was the system before this Qbot was used? What was the system that Qbot used? Qbot is also open source. It's a Node.js based, I think, um, app. It has various like backends that can plug into like Campbar, HipChat, Slap, like IRC, Jabber, all these other ones. The way deployments actually happen, that's like an internal app. But like it's not really that hard. Like we provide all the stuff through the deployment API. Basically, all you would need to implement to do that is however you currently do your deployment process, have he want make an HTTP call to whatever your current thing is saying, hey, I want you to deploy this branch here. Um, and as long as you can do that and make an outgoing HTTP call back to GitHub saying this is what was deployed here and when, then you can let like, that's it. Like it's, it the, de the deployment thing itself is not that hard, provided you're not like manually FTP machines, uh, sorry, manually FTP files to your machines, which hopefully not so is. Yeah. So can you drill down on that dashboard like into what the actual exceptions are? So you say you know it's like a so that's that's what Haystack is doing, and that's why I kind of didn't dig in there because there's a certain amount of background noise and it wouldn't be that interesting and it maybe might not like me, me or GitHub look as good as we should. Um, but yeah, basically you can if there was a, a big spike like yeah. that, yeah, your next step would be to jump into Haystack, yeah. see what the exceptions are that are spiking. Um, some examples from the last few weeks, like the, the two typical things that happen is the good one in some ways is the, the thing that spikes is you know 
something that's bad in your code, and it's a new exception, you haven't seen it before, and it's spiking because like a bunch of people hate this error. That's that's the better one. The bad ones are when the kind of background level exceptions all increase. So you've like destroyed somehow performance <coughs> fairly consistently over the entire site, which means you're probably doing something hideous to the you know something hideous to the back end or to uh, a database or whatever, and then those are the ones that are a bit harder to debug, and those are the ones where, again, in probably both of those cases, you would then immediately back out your branch, and with the speed of unemployments, that means, you know, if you're paying attention, it probably shouldn't affect people for more than kind of, you know, 10 or 20 seconds at worst. Yeah? I think I must have missed it in your talk on the slides, but what is the time scale between deploying to Canary production and then... So I think it's uh, 15 minutes. Uh, 10 or 15 minutes from uh, from Canary to like doing a full production deploy, and then I think afterwards we recommend like 15 to 30 minutes. You kind of are monitoring your production, but again that varies very much on the change you're doing. Like in this case, like I was basically 100% certain that this wasn't going to cause any adverse effects. I tested locally, and I know that like because I've done this on a, this same thing on another table before, I know that like. The way it's handling this in Rails, and I'm removing dead code effectively at this point. Um, if I was pushing something much more dramatic, I would probably spend a lot more time monitoring it, and then that's afterwards when you would spend time monitoring either other people's deploys because your code's still in production, just to make sure that like you haven't introduced new errors or whatever. Sorry, yeah. What, do you basically block other people's deploying until you merge it, or yeah. is that right? So yeah, the flow is. I've got a branch, I deploy the branch, that branch, the contents of that branch is now what is deployed with the production servers. No one else can do any deployments until I'm then done with testing my branch. The result of the testing the branch will be one of two things. Either I decide that my branch is not ready for production, in which case I back out, I basically say I'm done, and then the next person goes to the front of the queue, or I merge my branch, like my, merge my pull request, even. and then at that point it then also says the next person goes to the front. Sorry, what was the thing about doing Yeah, so we've we've been investigating that. I think the the tricky thing with us is doing that with the way everything is set up at the moment um, and the way stuff like that we handle database migrations, the way we handle assets, stuff like that makes it kind of tricky for us to do that at the moment. I think that's Definitely, kind of a goal eventually that we should be able to just, as you say, roll things out a lot more fluidly like that. Um, yeah, yeah. So, I guess that's what the canary is kind of doing a bit of that, like a, a light version of. We effectively, when we do the canary, we roll out to like one of each type of worker. So, we like have like a front end, the back end, like a background job processor, or whatever. So, one of each of them. Like gets this code and then we like see what happens. But yeah, by if that was done automatically, automatically stuff like back and stuff and out, that would be cool. James. Um, so how? So you talk about doing small pieces, but how do you handle the big pieces where everything changes at once? So like last year, there was a big UI change of all the tabs and things. So how is that? Very good question. So those changes are actually often not even a pull request. So what we do is we have. This would be could be a talk by itself. Uh, we do things called like staff shipping and dark shipping. So GitHub staff will have like a special like little flag on their profile, and part of that means that we get like opted in or out of certain features. So I had to remember in my screenshot today to go and like turn off the staff mode because everything looks like different because we're trying and experimenting with all these new features. The cool thing about that is that means that that code is all in production right now. Like it's sitting there, it's live, it's just more or less, it's not an if statement. We have a, a more good, like a, a nicer way of doing things than that. But you know, it's effectively an if statement. Are you staff or are you in this team? If not, give you the old code. If so, give you the new code. It's nice because it encourages you to write code that can work with both parts at once. Um, but it also means when you come to ship stuff production, it's been tested for quite a while. And the actual flipping the switch is just moving that feature from, um, you know, from just staff to everyone. But also with those things as well, what we tend to do is you can, that's one where you can do the gradual rollout. You can say, 
difference to 1%, users 10%, 25%, 50%, 100 People doing JavaScript and stuff, which I don't do, also do clever things where we like dock ship it. So sometimes what we'll do is we'll actually like render the entire feature in the background of the page and just not display it to make sure that we're not introducing like JavaScript errors and stuff like that. So we can dock ship it such that that new feature is there hiding on the page. You never see it, but that's our way of verifying that like you know it may have rendering issues, but it's not going to like bring down the site, for example. Uh, and again, we can like roll out those dog ships out gradually. So by the time it actually comes to like roll out a big massive UI refresh, yeah, it's just a matter of like clicking the button instead of having to merge pull refresh the image. Yep. What are the sort of typical bones of contention between developers and the infrastructure teams? I guess the usual ones. Um, so it was bad to like about two years ago. It, there was a banish situation, and a bunch of people, myself included, got kind of drafted into the infrastructure team. Um, and there was a the oh. usual kind of contention you tend to have with ops people and application people, where the yeah, the ops people felt that because they were the only ones on page rotations and the application people weren't, the application people would just throw stuff over the wall, um, and if everything blew up, that's fine. I don't need to worry about that. I'm not being paged. And obviously, responsible application people would be like being responsible. And irresponsible application people would be waking people up at three in the morning, because um, this is the, I guess, the, the blessing and curse of a geographically distributed workforce, and one where we don't mandate people work in offices and stuff like that. Is that you know I'm working away quite happily, you know, nine to five, and then that's you know three in the morning for someone in San Francisco. So those kind of balances, and then when people are getting woken up again and again and again and again by people being irresponsible, then like there's tension. Uh, but I think. That's something that we definitely resolved, and a big part of resolving that has been part of the infrastructure to like making some of our systems more kind of self-healing. And part of that has also been like the application engineers. A lot of them are now taking pages. Um, and when I say pages, it's not literal pages anymore. We use like the pager duty and it's like integrated with the keyboard and stuff like that. Such that if you break stuff, you will get paged sometimes as well. Um, and generally having like some of our microservices now have their own little page rotations. I want to call for this little microservice I manage like 50% of the day. But again, this is the, the classic thing that gets sold in problems like this. But surprise, surprise, that microservice never ever goes down. Because the first time it woke me up at 3 in the morning, I'm like, this is never going to go down and wake me up at 3 in the morning ever again. <laughs> so that's that's the kind of typical tensions. I would imagine people in here in office or engineering would kind of relate to that general relationship. And I think. To be honest, I think that is a relatively healthy tension in that you know, most companies, if you know, the ops people might want to make sure that no one ships code ever again because everything's nice and stable and working now and no one's getting paged and it's fine and nothing's on fire. And the application engineers want to ship things a million times a day because you know, if I break it, I can just push out a fix, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, and that tension, I think, is healthy and it results in better software and at the same time, software that's kind of iterated on faster stuff. I think we're good. Thank you very much for the questions.